Canadians should be actually very proud of this industry. Since becoming a content creator, I've become more aware of what people are sensitive about. And one thing in the gardening community that seems to be ever evolving and changing is the mediums we're allowed to use or that are ethically allowed to be used. Trying to raise awareness of the area's importance. Restoring the country's vast peat bogs. Looking at the vital role of Scotland's peatlands is underway. And I commonly get feedback from various different people saying my use of peat moss is unethical and wrong. And this is something I was not aware of previous to becoming an influencer. Now, to be fair, I use a lot of peat moss in my gardening and houseplant setup. And I even actually try to reuse as much as I possibly can for ethical reasons, but also for the budget or pocketbook. And I've even taken the time to document my failures with coconut choir and the fact that I literally cannot find the equivalent. By nature, I question everything, which is why I thought I needed to get down to the bottom of the story about peat moss. There's a few reasons for this. The first one being, I know there's a second side of the story. Now, some will say that this is particular to the Canadian industry and they would be absolutely right. But rather than me just telling you the cliche coconut coir is better than this stuff, I thought I would interview some professionals in the industry. And to say I wasn't shocked by some of the stuff that they were telling me would be an understatement. Even I learned some new things. So I hope you guys can sit back, relax, soak in the information and let me know in the comments down below if this helped you at all with your decisions when it came to choosing peat moss over the coconut coir substitute. So we officially have Asha or Asha here today and she is with the CS PMA. She's the president of this group. And first off, my followers will have no idea what this is. <laughs> I only know what this is because I did some soil forestry courses. So I know what this is, but can you explain to the subscribers what it means to be a president of this group? Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. And, uh, this is exciting. I mean, I have to say, uh, I've been watching your YouTube channel for, for a while. And um, when I started getting into this industry, you were someone that I, I relied on to get information. So great to have, great to, oh, to meet you. That's <laughs> um, awesome. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So as, as you said, Ashley, uh, my name is Asha Hingarani. I'm the president of the Canadian Sphagnum Peat Moss Association. CSPMA is, is our acronym. And uh, what an industry association is, we, we have a group of members that, that pay a fee. And uh, as, as a trade association or an industry association, we would lobby or act on behalf of the industry uh, when communicating with stakeholders. So whether that's growers or, or politicians, federally or provincially, uh, we'd be the voice of the industry. We have uh, the industry itself, uh, so I represent about 14 producers across Canada. And for your, for your viewers, the peat industry in Canada is primarily in Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Quebec, Ontario, and uh, New Brunswick. I've walked on like a peatland before. It feels like you're walking on the moon. For anyone watching or listening to this, it feels like walking on the moon. I'm sure you will agree <laughs> with that. It's the most bizarre feeling ever. It's, 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 it's neat. And I encourage, um, in fact, if any of your viewers uh, want to know more or are interested in visiting a bog and, and have that, you know, um, connection to the industry and they, they need to new, learn more, uh, we're happy to, to help host and, and. Oh, well, sign me up. I may be the only person that shows up, <laughs> but I'm coming because so that was we'll always my favorite. You sure. yep. Yeah. You always, you bring rubber boots. That's all yeah. I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe hip waders, depending on the age of the bog. And so once someone's accepted in and we find out they are ethically harvesting peat, they are caring for those peatlands, they have someone similar to Pierre who is um, taking the time to use natural resource management, et cetera, and so forth they get a stamp of approval. And so that consumer can find out which companies they're purchasing from and which ones are following your rules, which are based on preserving and caring for those peatlands, correct? That's right. I mean, we, uh, uh, you know, we're proud in Canada to have a certification called the Veriflora certification. It's a responsibly uh, managed peatland. It looks at, um, you know, various aspects of, of resource development ensuring that we're monitoring greenhouse gases, ensuring that we're, we're adhering to fair labor practices. 
Um, we have a full uh, reclamation plan in place where we're consulting with Indigenous communities. So these are all the, the, the requirements to ensure, you know, if you are a member of the CSTMA, uh, you're, you have the resources through the, through the association to help with these measures. I'd have to say um, we have a duty to consult under uh, provincial regulation and federal regulation, but uh, it's something that the industry is, is proud of. And we, we do work with those communities and, and employ Indigenous peoples, you know, ensure that they have a good understanding of, of what we do of the industry. Um, another another thing that we're we're quite proud of is the fact that actually just last week we signed a memorandum of understanding with a conservation group, uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada. Uh, this oh, nice. is a, a renewed uh, five year partnership uh, that will work on responsibly managed peatlands. We share um, knowledge, science based knowledge, um, and et cetera. And we're we're pretty proud of that. Yeah, I know when I was working with Forest Soils, um, one of the things that we always would talk about was wetlands and peat bogs being sacred to first nations they were considered they're considered sacred sites so harvesting from them obviously that relationship needs to be there and then for the ducks and limited side as well just for uh wildlife habitat very unique species anyone who did not know this canada has carnivorous plants it's not just a tropical thing and they exist in the peatlands <laughs> so um so when it comes to the impact of peat harvesting what is that impact on Canada? I know you sent me some stats, um, mm -hmm. but what are kind of the the ones that you want to bring to the forefront for people? Yeah, I think um, one, I'll, I'll just highlight one. And this is, uh, when I first came into this industry, this kind of blew me away because I didn't know too much about the whole, um, you know, the, the industry footprint, so to speak. So mm -hmm. in Canada, we have 114 million hectares of peatlands. Uh, I think we're the second largest wow. uh, than, than Russia. I believe Russia has, has the most. And in regards to the industry footprint, and I said, I'm, I may have said earlier that we're, we've been around as an industry for, for only 90 years. So I'd say that's, that's fairly young. Um, mm -hmm. We've only, you know, in terms of our, our footprint of where we, since the nine, since 90 years ago, we've only worked on or harvested about 34,000 hectares. So that's 0.03% oh. of, of uh, you know, Canadian peatland. So it's very, very insignificant in terms of our, our industry. Focus. Oh, wow. And you know, that number, it's shocking to hear that number. But then you think about the stats on how long you will harvest a single bog for. And isn't it decades in some cases? From my understanding, it depends on the quality of the peat but it can be up to like 40 years. Uh, so that would make sense because um, for anyone watching, peat bogs are not just this little linear uh, cup on the top of the earth. They are literal sunken um, ditches almost. They're where the glacier came along, you know, ripped and tore and left a big divot in the earth. And that's where the peat is building up over time. So that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but that's what that is. So it's, it's, it's horizontal, but it also goes downwards as well. And, and then one of your next guests may speak to this in more detail, but in Canada, we only harvest the, the top layer of it, whereas in other parts of the world, they may, they may harvest uh, uh, more deeper. But, um, and that's because, and, and I'm happy to, to speak on this as well, is um, in Canada, we're obliged. And as an industry, we, um, we restore our peatlands. So uh, mm. having that, that only that top layer allows for that, um, the ecological restoration to, to take. Oh, that's so interesting. So you're not digging for woolly mammoths or finding yeah. like any crazy, <laughs> no saber tooth tigers. And no like no bodies yet here. found. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts on the banning of peat in North America. We've seen this in Europe and I know this is probably a horrendously sensitive subject to you, but I'm so glad that you are open to discussing this, but there's a big movement for it. There are petitions, there's people talking to politicians, federally and provincially, um, all that sort of stuff. I know from an industry perspective, when it comes to employment, it's a big deal if it got banned. Um, I know from talking to Premier Tech that they're working on uh, peat substitutes that can be incorporated with peat um, as a renewable resource. What is your thoughts on this? Is this the way that the industry should go or not? And I know another thing that was uh, spoken about in an earlier interview was the food security and just the reliability of peat over coconut coir. Now, I personally have used coconut coir. 
I keep on getting told I'm buying the wrong stuff. I've tried several different brands. I just do not get the same results. I don't. When it comes to food production, everything looks a little bit worse than something grown in peat. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, and it, it is a it is a tricky subject. I mean, um, you know, you can go on Twitter and just hashtag uh, peat free, and you'll get tons of articles and people talking about that. And I think um, a lot of that information is coming from Europe because that discussion is is, is very wide right now, and the EU is looking at that, and very dis- various countries are looking at at banning peat. I think we have to think about a number of things. Number one, I think. Um, when you think about peat in Canada, we only use it for horticultural purposes. Uh, we do not use it for energy. So in Europe, uh, you know, decades for decades, they use peat for energy. In Canada specifically, we, we only oh. use it for horticultural purposes. Um, you mentioned food security. Uh, during the COVID, uh, ni- COVID-19 pandemic, you know, provincial and federal governments uh, saw the industry as an essential service uh, because we're, we're, we're critical for that fa- food supply. About, I'd say around 86 to to 90% of our peat in Canada is exported to the U.S. And that's going to to growers who are growing fruits and vegetables that we can't necessarily grow in Canada. And it's just back to to our our grocery store shelves. I mean, I always use this example, and maybe I I spoke to you about this earlier, but if you think about Taco Tuesday, right? Like it's it's a regular week week nights and you're you're doing your, your tacos with your pico gallo and your your... Uh, jalapeno peppers and your tomatoes, like those were likely grown by growers that used uh, peat in their growing media. So, and, those, and that growing media is consistent and reliable. And that's what we need to uh, ensure if we want to, you know, make sure we have food security. In terms of, you know, the, the ban, I think consumers have to understand that there, there are alternatives and the peat industry is not against it. In fact, most of us use alternatives, but what we are doing in Canada, I, and I can, I can speak to Canada, is the fact that uh, we're doing it in a responsible way. And peat is local. Uh, you know, if you're using cocoa choir, there's going to be uh, transport issues. There's water yeah. that's required to clean that. Um, whereas in, in Canada, if you, you see the Vera Flora certification, you know that there's a, a very strict rules and regulations that are around that harvesting of peat. Yeah. And I know um, from my perspective in soil science is whenever we're introducing a new medium, regardless of what it is, if it's a compost, manure, peat, coconut coir, we always are concerned about potential microbes that are added and things being added that could be invasive and compete with natural microbiota but peat because it's from a canadian soil system it already is inoculated with the microbes or the values that are um, native to our area and i mean coconut obviously we don't grow those here i mean maybe one day with you know climate change and stuff we'll get there but right (laughs) now yeah we're not so um can you speak to the regulatory rules in an in Canada, I know Environment Canada is uh, lightly involved in this. I'm sure agri- uh, Agriculture, Agri-Foods Canada is. When I was studying peat and peat bogs, I was just told that this is heavily regulated. You cannot willy-nilly just go in and, you know, rip up a peat bog. There's a lot of rules when it comes to this. And one you did mention was you can't harvest the whole depth. I mentioned earlier the different provinces that we, we work in. Uh, each province has, has their own rules and regulations around, mm-hmm. um, around the industry, and we have to respect that, of course. It could take up to seven years to uh, acquire a license to, um, to harvest on a peat bog. Oh, wow. And, and that, that takes into consideration the species at risk analysis. Um, you have to have a full reclamation plan in place, so you have to be committed to restoring that bog after you're done with it. Um, and, uh, you know, just keep in mind that that's also uh, could cost millions of dollars as well, but the industry is committed to that. And in fact, we have a, a national uh, peatland initiative that, that commits our members to restoring that, those peatlands after use. So, and the industry is quite, quite proud of that. We also have to consult with Indigenous communities, as I mentioned, and of course that, that does take time. And then we have to work, work with the government to ensure that all those boxes are checked and, and uh, then we're ready to go. But that process could take up to, to seven years. So there's no orphaned peat harvesting sites. We always hear about that orphaned wells in Alberta. There's none of that. You guys already checked all the boxes there. Yeah, and I think it's it's slightly different in each province, but 
in terms of the, the timing, it's, it's not like we could just, you know, go to uh, the provincial legislator and, and ask for, for buy the land and start har- harvesting. It's not yeah. easy. So. so your average Canadian cannot go out with a bucket and just start. <laughs> no. Building. Yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming on here today. My subscribers are absolutely going to love this. There's also going to be some podcast listeners as well that are going to enjoy this too. So I want to thank you so much for coming on um, and we'll get the next person. Do you have any closing comments? I think, you know, uh, my closing would say, I just, you know, I, I think uh, Canadians should be actually very proud of this industry. Uh, we have invested over 30 years uh, in science industry partnerships to ensure that our our work is is you know adhered to science. We work very closely with Dr. L- Dr. Lynn Rochford, Dr. Maria Strack, Dr. Nigel Wright uh, from McGill, Laval, and Waterloo U- University. Uh, we have partnerships with very other universities across Canada and NSERC, so the federal government. To, to better understand the science. I, I think it's a natural resource Canadians don't know very much about, but I think it's a, one that can be championed like, like our, our dairy and our eggs and our, our oil and gas industry. And I think, you know, um, if, if we educate ourselves a little bit more about where our food is grown, how it's grown and the importance of growing media and peace in growing media, uh, it's a, a truly uh, Canadian story that I think should be championed. I. Thank you for saying that because I 100% agree with that. I When I first initially started looking at the peat industry way like 10 years ago, I was like, this is so cool. We're awesome at this compared to other countries. Yeah. And then when I became an influencer, everyone's like, this is an evil product. And I'm like, what? No, I was yeah. super proud of this. <laughs> well, and you know, your listeners have to understand people are coming to Canada to understand how we're restoring the bonds and yes. how successful we're doing it. And I think, you know, that is, it's, uh, it's something we're extremely proud of and um, you know, we're being seen as the leaders. Uh, so that's something that Canadians don't know much about. And I want to yeah. tell that story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure.